Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Royal Holloway Geography for Schools lecture. My name is Veronica de la Dora, and I am one of the lecturers in the Geography Department here at Royal Holloway. In uh, this lecture, we will talk about sound and the sense of place, which relates to the topic of dynamic places in the A-level geography curriculum. Now, sound might seem a strange topic as geography is an inherently visual discipline. As opposed to a landform or to a building, sound is something that we can't really see or even picture in our mind. So talking about sound in a geography lecture might feel a bit weird or unusual. What has a sound to do with geography? And what has geography to do with sound? Well, Perhaps the uh, first thing to say here is that sound is a spatial phenomenon. In other words, sound propagates through space. Sound waves are compression waves that are produced by a vibrating object, which could be, for example, a bell, a drum, or like here, a siren. So when I ring uh, the bell, or I beat the drum, or I play the siren, all these objects vibrate and the vibration causes the air molecules around those objects to move. And these molecules bump into the molecules close to them, and in turn, they cause them to vibrate as well. And this results in a wave of vibrations that travels through the air and that is carried to our ear. So we can think uh, of air as something similar to a jelly block. If you hit the jelly block on one side, you will see the movement uh, propagating through it and reaching the other side of the, of the block. And the same happens with sound. Sound also propagates uh, through media other than air, like uh, water, for example. But uh, without air, uh, without matter in uh, outer space or in a vacuum, for example, there is no sound. So sound needs both uh, a medium and space in order to exist. Sound uh, is, uh, as I said, a spatial phenomenon. A sound is not just about space, it is also about place. Sounds can produce distinctive atmospheres and they can contribute to our individual and collective experiences of place. And this is what uh, we human geographers are interested in and this is what I would like to talk about today. So in this lecture, we will talk about sounds and the sense of place. We will talk about the concept of soundscape. And finally, we will talk about contested sound. But uh, before we get into sound, it might be helpful to pause for a moment on uh, these two words that I've just used, space and place. These are words that uh, we use in our everyday speech that we usually take for granted and that we sometimes use uh, almost uh, interchangeably. However, they do indicate different things. Space is an abstract geometrical dimension. It is something we all experience uh, when we move or when we travel in terms of distance, for example. But it's also something that we can't really picture in our mind. Space is uh, something invisible, something intangible, uh, something ungraspable. Space is something abstract and it can also be infinite. Place, by contrast, is uh, something localized. And yet, at the same time, place is so much more than uh, uh, a location or just a point in space. Unlike space, places do have a shape. They do have a material texture. They are something that we can't actually picture in our mind. We can all uh, think of uh, uh, specific places like a street, a town, our home, our bedroom, our dining room and so on. And uh, we all associate images to these places. More importantly, place is a location that we invest with meaning. And like space, place is something that is deeply subjective. And I will just give you a little example here. 
I originally come uh, from Veleda, that is um, this um, thin uh, strip of land, this island between the Lagoon of Venice and uh, the Adriatic Sea in Office Italy. And uh, one of my favorite uh, places on Veleda is uh, this little lighthouse at the end of uh, uh, this uh, breakwater here. Now, if you were a sailor and were looking for it uh, in uh, uh, your pilot book, you would read that um, the uh, geographical coordinates of uh, this lighthouse are 45 degrees 2500 north and 12 degrees 2300 east. That is the location of uh, the lighthouse. However, to me and uh, to many other local people from Valida, this little lighthouse is not just the location. It is a special place. That's where I used to walk with my mom as a child, where I used to play with my friends, where I used to bike uh, as a teenager. That's where people from Valida stroll uh, during the weekend. Uh, if it's a nice sunny day. That's um, a destination for summer excursioners coming from the mainland or from uh, other nearby islands. That's the meeting point uh, of young couples, but also uh, of retired old men and uh, fishermen. So this lighthouse is the place to which myself and many other local people have attached our memories and our stories. So I have my little lighthouse, but I'm sure that you all have a favorite place or a place to which you feel especially attached. This can be home, it can be the local parish, it can be a summer retreat, it can be a square, a street, a pub, a tennis club, a park, so on. Now, this guy uh, called Yifu Tuan, uh, who was a Chinese American geographer who has recently passed away, calls this attachment topophilia, which literally means the love of place. Topophilia, Tuan says, is that special affective band between people and places. More in general, human geographers talk about the sense of place, that is the relationship between people and places based on meanings and attachment, the subjective and emotional attachment that people have to place. Novels and movies often evoke uh, this sense of place, you know, that feeling that really the readers or the spectators know what is uh, like uh, to be there. You get the feeling of being immersed uh, in that place, even if it's just a, an imaginary uh, place. So we can think of topophilia uh, as a very strong sense of place that is usually tied to our memory of a specific place, to the experiences to, uh, that uh, we link to, to that place. For some reason, landmarks like my little lighthouse tend to cluster memories and to foster a uh, collective sense of place, maybe because they are uh, more visible than uh, uh, other features in the landscape. However, attachment to place is not simply visual, it is multi-sensorial. It entails uh, different senses. And sound here plays an especially important role. Sound triggers memory in a powerful, almost visceral way maybe even more so than images. In this way, sound helps create a deep sense of belonging. A simple tune of an old song can suddenly evoke memories of childhood. It, make, uh, it can make one uh, feel homesick. It can evoke a distant home for the migrant. It can transport us to faraway places or to a past that we know will never return. These qualities intimately bind sound with place and with nostalgia. At the same time, sound can transform, even transfigure places. Think, for example, of a basker playing his guitar in a shopping street, or uh, singing in a tube station in central London, or playing the violin in a square. The music does something to the atmosphere of that place. The tube station without the singer or the square without the violinist playing his music 
are not the same without them. And of course, uh, there are buildings that are architected specifically for this purpose, for being transfigured by music. Think, uh, for example, when you enter a silent church and then think of the same uh, space as the choir starts uh, to, chant, to chant and the sound uh, of uh, uh, the voices climbs up to the vault and reverberates through the building. Or think of a concert venue before and during the concert. And uh, in some instances, music is used to manipulate places and our behaviors. Think of uh, uh, background mood uh, music in a supermarket or in a shopping mall, for example, how it augments the visual display of products, how it changes the atmosphere, how it helps one relax and thus spend more time in that space and possibly uh, more money as well. Or think of the background music in a fitness center, how it gives a rhythm to those exercising in that space, but um, how it also creates a specific atmosphere. Sound, however, is not just music. Sound comes in different shapes. So we can think of music as a carefully crafted sound, as sound architected to produce powerful emotional responses in the listener. But on the other end of the spectrum, we find noise, like traffic noise. And think of the stress it causes. That's actually the opposite uh, of ambient music. But what is noise? Noise is unwanted sound. But we can also think uh, of noise as sound out of place. In this sense, the concept of noise is relative. What is noise for me or for you? can be music for somebody else. And here, place matters again. For example, loud music in certain public spaces, like a park or a beach, is dim noise and banned from that space, like, uh, you know, in the same way as uh, drinking or, or littering, for example. So, sound is not something homogeneous. It is something complex and fluid. Sound is an invisible force that continuously shapes the places that we inhabit, sometimes without we even realize it. Think of sounds uh, connected to the places where you live. The barking of your neighbor's dog, the cries of the seagulls who live near the sea, the ringing uh, of bells from uh, some church in the distance, the screams of local vendors in the market, or think of uh, less pleasant artificial sounds the noise of the cars, the airplanes, if like me, you live near an airport, the siren of the ambulance, your mom vacuum cleaning early in the morning while you were still half asleep in your bed. You might also want to think about uh, the other way around. How does the absence of certain sounds transform places? One of the things that struck me during the first COVID lockdown was the streets going silent. No cars, no noise, very few flights leaving from Heathrow, no laughter of children in the park. Without uh, these usual sounds, everything felt still. But then we might have started to notice sounds that we really didn't pay very much attention to, or sounds we just couldn't hear, like uh, the chirping of birds, for example or the wind rustling through the trees. So an exercise that you could do is uh, to think how specific sounds or silences affect your sense of place. Are there particular sounds that you associate to home or to your school or to your neighborhood? In other words, are there specific sounds that shape your experience of that one specific place? Now, I asked this question to my students here at Royal Holloway, and I asked them to take a walk around campus and to note down the sounds that they heard. Then I asked them to circle the sounds that uh, they thought uh, helped them define their own sense of place at uni. And I've got some um, very interesting responses. 
Um, some students, for example, mentioned the treating of birds and the wind rustling through the trees. We have a lovely, very green campus. And uh, this uh, type of response usually came from students uh, coming from central London and other uh, busy, uh, noisy places. Other students uh, mentioned airplanes. Our campus is not far from Mount uh, Little Airport. Uh, so you always hear uh, airplanes in, in the background. Other students uh, mentioned um, different types of sounds like fire alarm tests. Uh, a popular one uh, uh, was the voice of lectures spinning out of the lecture theater, uh, which students hear uh, as they um, uh, pass by and they walk in uh, down, down the corridor. Um, other students uh, mentioned the uh, typing uh, of uh, students, other students taking uh, notes in class and so on. Now, altogether, these sounds form what the geographers and sound scholars call a soundscape. Technically, a soundscape is defined as any portion of the uh, sonic environment as it is perceived by humans. This concept was uh, popularized in uh, the 1970s by Raymond Murray Sheffer, who was a Canadian composer and an environmentalist. Like landscapes, soundscapes, Sheffer noted, have features that are more prominent than others. There are sounds that recur on a regular basis, like uh, church bells, for example. There are sounds uh, that uh, stand in the background, like the airplanes, there are sounds that uh, stand in the foreground, like uh, the fire alarm or the uh, uh, voice of, of the lecturer. To some of uh, uh, the sounds, community might attach specific meanings. And Shepard calls uh, the sounds sound marks. In other words, sounds in the landscape that are specially regarded by a community. The sound marks uh, are those uh, that uh, historically help shape uh, local identities. For example, think of uh, church bells signposting in the day in a small village in, uh, in the countryside. Interestingly, early work on soundscape came largely in response to an increasing disillusionment with modernity. It came uh, with the rise of uh, acoustic pollution and with uh, what was perceived as a loss uh, of sense of place and the gradual disappearance of uh, traditional soundscapes, which went hand in hand with the uh, transformation of uh, traditional neighborhoods. So most of this work on soundscapes and the sense of place is often underpinned uh, by a sense of loss or of impending loss, by a sense of nostalgia for the sounds of earlier times but also by the desire to preserve the memory of uh, these sounds. For example, in uh, the early 1970s, Sheffer led the uh, World Soundscape Project. This was a big project which aimed at capturing and preserving some of these uh, lost sounds, sounds uh, or, or, or sounds that uh, Sheffer thought were destined to vanish. Sheffer and his team embarked in a survey of soundscapes across Canada, but also uh, in villages from uh, uh, different European countries. And they recorded sounds, but they also recorded uh, elderly people's memories of past sounds, like the creaking of the horse-powered carts, for example. But uh, it wasn't just uh, soundscapes that had changed, it was also how people perceive them and uh, related to them. And uh, going uh, further back in time, for early modern uh, people, communal sounds like the ringing, for example, conveyed uh, very specific information. The sound of uh, uh, church bells uh, marked uh, festivities. It announced weddings and uh, funerals. Church bells uh, marked uh, uh, or signposted different parts uh, of the day, but they also marked the uh, boundaries between different parishes. Uh, that sound uh, helped the pilgrims and travelers orient themselves in the countryside or in a forest. In other words, 
people were not only surrounded by different sounds, but uh, they also consciously listen for sounds that today we normally tend to ignore or just take for granted. So this leads to my next point. Sounds mean different things to different people. For this reason, like places, sounds can be controversial or contested, and they can change their meaning over time. A good example is foghorns. Foghorns are the sonic equivalent of lighthouses. When the fog uh, gets thick, the light of the beacon can uh, hardly penetrate it, so lighthouses become useless, and uh, acoustic signals are used instead to warn ships of a hazard or uh, uh, to help them uh, find the, the position at sea. In the past, however, the sound uh, was not just a uh, navigational device for those who were out at sea, it was also a sort of a familiar soundtrack for the people uh, who lived on the coast. Its repeated sound contributed to create a reassuring sense of place for these communities. It was part of their everyday life. It signposted uh, the silence of uh, uh, long, uh, foggy uh, winter nights. However, over time, uh, GPS and digital navigation technologies have made the uh, foghorns redundant. So, about uh, 10 years ago, those foghorns and uh, fog sirens were decommissioned in Britain uh, and in Europe. And interestingly, in most cases, the decommissioning of these devices uh, caused the protests, not of sailors, but of those coastal communities who had grown emotionally attached to their sound. In, those coastal in, uh, in some coastal towns of, of the Adriatic, locals forced mayors uh, to reactivate a foghorn or a, uh, a fog siren um, at the expenses of the council, just because they had uh, got so attached to, to that sound as a community. Now, the irony is that uh, the same sounds were originally targets of protests. When uh, foghorns uh, were first introduced in Britain and uh, elsewhere, locals perceived their sound as gloomy and depressing, or as simply disruptive. By contrast to the following generations, the bygone bellowing of the foghorn, but even uh, the less appealing sound of more modern folk sirens appeared pleasing and romantic. Why? Because it had the capacity to evoke the past and to deepen the sense of place. So, Sounds can change meaning over time, but they can also have different meanings for different communities and be contested, just as places can be contested. So in this last part uh, of uh, the lecture, I would like to focus on this aspect. One thing to notice uh, uh, here is that unlike vision, but like smells, sounds transcend physical boundaries. For example, in uh, the uh, late 1980s and in the uh, early 1990s, certain former industrial towns in Britain saw the emergence of a new fashion of illegal parties that were held in abandoned warehouses. This part is revolved around the use of ecstasy drugs and the so-called acid music. For the party goers, this music, which was played very loud, was uh, what transformed empty, abandoned spaces into places. These places, however, were temporary. They basically vanished when the music stopped at the end of the party. Now, imagine you lived nearby and were not a party goer and you just wanted to sleep. Because the music was so loud, it penetrated beyond uh, the immediate venue and, of course, it caused the process of local residents. So this leakage of sound, this leakage uh, of uh, music, which the party goers experienced as liberating, was perceived by others as noise, as a nuisance. It was also perceived as a threat. It was a sound that uh, the local residents associated with drugs and uh, with immoral behavior. So in this case, sound penetrated walls and invaded the neighborhood 
and clashed with the prevailing values of a mainstream society. And this, of course, generated tensions and often uh, the, even the intervention of the police. And we can think of uh, many other very different examples of uh, contested sounds. We can think, for example, uh, of sun marks in uh, cities where different religious communities coexist and sometimes clash. For example, uh, Toby, Fen sorry, Toby Fenster, uh, who is a, uh, a professor of uh, geography from the University of Tel Aviv, has written about uh, soundscape, the soundscape of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, she says, is a city of constant religious sounds, like Christian church bells, the voices of the Muezzin calling Muslims to prayer, but also other ritual sounds that are not necessarily meant to be heard in a uh, public space. For example, she mentions uh, songs and prayers that are chanted in uh, uh, Jewish homes before and after the meal, so during Sabbath, but uh, that one can hear from a street level. So in this case, sound transcends the uh, private space and enters the uh, public space. But the call of the Muslim and uh, the uh, church bells uh, do uh, the opposite. They uh, enter, uh, they can enter um, private homes and uh, call uh, uh, faithful uh, to, to prayer. They can also travel uh, uh, to different uh, quarters uh, of the city and sometimes uh, cause conflicts, especially uh, Jews and uh, Palestinians. In certain uh, Muslim countries, church bells are banned so that the soundscape is entirely dominated by the Muslims' uh, call for prayer. And the same is true of uh, Muslim calls for prayer in uh, non-Muslim countries. So chants can become projections in space of specific communal identities. And they can also mark the uh, power relationships between uh, these different communities, in the same way as the visibility of uh, religious uh, buildings and landmarks in, in the landscape. But sounds can also be markers uh, of the peaceful coexistence uh, of different ethnic groups. And this is especially the case in uh, global cities uh, like London. The other thing to note is that uh, unlike in uh, past centuries, sounds are no longer anchored to a single place. They can be reproduced um, on the radio or on the web, for example. And in this way, they can move around. So a song does not simply cross uh, the walls of the room or uh, of the building in which it is being chanted. It can uh, also cross uh, entire countries or continents or oceans. So another exercise that uh, you could do is uh, to take a walk in central London and to record its sounds. Which languages do people speak? Which music is being played? And which sort of uh, sense of place does this soundscape conjure up? What does sound tell us about that place and its community? So to sum up, what I wanted to show to you today is that sound is uh, a uh, fundamental dimension of human experience. And as such, it humanizes space and it turns it into place. Sound play a crucial role in stimulating emotional attachment to places, in charging places with meaning. Chants mobilize feelings of belonging and nostalgia. They may transmit an idea of home and fill a place with ideas about the past. Sound transforms places, but it can also be received differently at different moments in time. And sound can be contested, like place itself. But like place itself, sound can shape complex multicultural identities and senses of place. So this is why I think that paying attention to sound can be an interesting way into the study of dynamic places and phenomena like globalization. 
thank you for your attention and I look forward to seeing you at Royal Holloway.